you like doing interviews? All right. Um, this, you're listening to an episode of the NEPA Freethought Society podcast. Today we're recording live from NEPA Pride Fest 2012. And joining me here today is... I'm Pastor John Murray from Tree of Life Christian Fellowship. Okay, so what brings you here today to Pride Fest? Well, um, there's probably a, a couple of reasons. We trust that the greatest motiv- motivation is God's love for the people that are here. He loves everyone here so much he died upon the cross for him, but there's also other things involving truth and proclamation. Okay, so why Pride Fest? Well, pride is, uh, if you, if you, pride tells you is the very opposite of humility. It's the ultimate expression of the Adamic nature. And so we can see, there you go. As you can see, um, wherever there is, um, what's the center, le- center letter in the word pride? It's the same one that's in the word sin. It's I. And in the realm of I is the realm of the fallen nature of man. When man is self-centered, man's his own God. And, of course, man is not God. So now there are many different religious organizations inside Pride Fest, and they're preaching messages of inclusiveness, where they're saying that LGBT people are welcome, homosexuality is acceptable. So what is what is your response to that? Well, they're lying. Those people are lying. Because in reality, homosexuality is a mockery of, of God's intention. It's, and it's, it's really, truly, that's some of the greatest hypocrisy that can be named. The idea that we're going to take marriage and we're going to use marriage as a basis for okaying um, a, a union between a man and a man and a woman and a woman. That is the ultimate hypocrisy and opposite every, everything that is truth. Where does, where does marriage come from? It comes from the Bible. It comes from the Word of God. That's where it comes from. If we follow the Word of God through the Scripture very, very plainly, what we saw what God did at Sodom and Gomorrah is a warning to every generation that God will judge uh, God will judge the sin of homosexuality and lesbianism. So some people, when they look to the Bible, look at marriages where there would be several wives and concubines and all sorts of different relationships through the Bible. So what do you have to say about that? Well, obviously, since since we hit the times of the New Testament, marriage is between one man and one and one woman, and during those times, there's a lot, a lot before God brought a knowledge to the people of what His His intentions were in those things. See, God's intention in marriage is for a man and a woman to be joined together to produce life. You, two men cannot produce life. Two women cannot produce life. It's physically impossible. Well, when people talk about marriage, they're also talking about civil benefits they get from government or tax breaks or whatever happens to be the case. So if the government were to allow marriage but churches didn't recognize it, would you solve a problem with it then? Yes, I would have a problem because it's the ultimate hypocrisy. Marriage comes from the scriptures. The first marriage was performed by God, and, and, and the word of God very strictly prohibits. It says that anybody involved in homosexuality, feminism, lesbianism, shall in no case enter into the kingdom of God. So Why, why, why not just call why take marriage? Why can't it just be a civil union? Point. Why can't it just be if if they're going to go that way, go that way? Why can't it just be a civil union? Why is have to? Why a biblical term marriage? Why seek why seek God's blessing to something that God is opposed to? So, what is the basis for there your you your belief in God then? My belief for God is because because all of all of creation testifies to me that there's a God. I've personally met the Lord. I have per, I'm a personal witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. The same spirit that raised you from the dead dwells in me and has quickened me. It's so, translated me. So you appeal to creation. Many listeners of this show, and myself included, look around and we see natural disasters that seem to be a defeater to belief in God. So if an all-loving, all-powerful, all-knowing being created the universe, why would there be things like natural disasters, mental illnesses? Well, all that is the result of sin. That, that's all because of the fall, because of sin. It has nothing at all to do with God. If, if man never chose to sin, we would not... Uh, we would not... Okay, go. Okay. So, a lot of people will take it back to the natural laws of the universe, uh, regularities we see in nature, that if God made the universe with natural disasters, that seems to have nothing to do with sin. So what is your response to that? Well... This may seem like I'm not answering you directly, but consider. I believe science today has discovered sextillion, 600 quintillion stars, something like that, last I've heard. Sure. 
and all of those and the star that's closest to us we call our sun right the, uh, Psalm 19 tells us that the stars are all and the planets are all the stars are all on lines like for example right now this uh, our sun is traveling through space at 30,000 miles an hour at the same time this planet is revolving around the sun right at some 66,000 700 miles an hour something like that as we're spinning at 1,000 miles an hour if there was not divine intelligence in the setting of the universe everything would just be cracking into one another so you you go to Manhattan and you'll see the intelligence of, of man but you'll, you'll see you'll see things cracking up every single day you see cars trucks so cracking up every day. now a lot of people will say well the universe doesn't seem to be so finely tuned because about 99% of the universe is uninhabitable so what would your response be to that well my response would be I believe it's in Deuteronomy 29 29 says the Lord has the things that he shows to us which is so vast you could never even learn what he shows to us and then he has his secrets and some of those things he just doesn't reveal to us, which is fine with me. God's not obligated to have to reveal. So, reveal everything. Okay. So you say that since there isn't chaos, that there has to be a God. But why does there have to be God? Why couldn't there just be natural laws that would establish order? Where did, where, where did the natural world start? My question is, anybody that would ask that question is where is not to avoid the question, but where did the world start? Where, where did ma the material world start? How to have its beginning? Well, is it, see, it seems accident? like the, the Big Bang is the prevailing answer. But the Big Bang is ridiculous. It, it's, it's, well, what do you mean? It's just ridiculous. <laughs> but there was all of a sudden there was a bang and then there was a material well, well, world. Well, not a bang. It's just that there was all sorts of matter that existed the matter and the matter from? expanded. Well, matter see, from? now, if, if I say I don't know in regards to how the universe started... Why should we go from I don't know to God started the universe just because we lack an explanation? Well, like I already said, the universe denotes tremendous intelligence. The stars are on the line. There's tremendous intelligence. Any, I can look, as an ornithologist, I can look at a migrating bird and I can see the wonderful design of, of creation. You can see the intelligence of God in every single thing. See, now, it takes more faith, to me it would take more faith to believe Suddenly matter came out of nowhere and exploded, and now all of a sudden we have this whole wonderful creation. Well, what if Maybe I... like take a metal, throw it in the air, and down would come a brand new Rolls Royce. It's ridiculous. What if I remain agnostic on issues of how the universe started and say, I don't know. I don't know the answer. So, that's your opinion. So, so why go to God, then? Because we lack an explanation. Huh? Why go to God because we lack an explanation? Well, well, because the Lord reveals himself to us. It, it says in the scriptures that the, the entire created world reveals to us that there's a God. I, I can take a look at everything that I see around me reveals that there's a God. I look at a migrating there's... bird and I see Isaiah 40, 31. I look at the stars and I see him declaring the glory of God. So some people might say that you're just seeing patterns, that you're establishing order and creativity because you see the order and creativity, but it might not be so. But, here, but I didn't establish anything. The trees were already here before I was ever born. The sky, the stars, it was all here before I ever came into being. So I how do you... I haven't established anything. So you believe in an all-loving God? He's an all-loving, all-wise, all all-powerful, all-just, all-seeing, all-knowing, all-powerful God. So how do you derive the attributes? The attributes of God? Right. Um, how, how do you mean, how do I derive? You mean, how do well, I there, come there's one thing to say that the universe was caused... But how do you go from the cause of the universe is this specific being? Okay, God spoke and he created. I, I have absolutely no, no problem with that whatsoever at all. Because everything I see in creation is testifies of vast and great intelligence. So there's an interesting argument that comes about by a philosopher, Stephen Law. He calls it the evil God challenge. He says that we can look around this world and see all sorts of natural calamities. We see a lot of good stuff. We see a lot of bad stuff. So it seems that there's enough evidence to establish that there's an all-evil being or an all-good being. So why is an all-good not only more rational than an all-evil being, but profoundly more rational? Well, the all e there is all-evil. That comes from Satan, who is a fallen cherubim. It's filled like exactly where we're at here today, the pride fest. Well, Satan's fall was pride. He saw no need of God. Well, I'm talking about the creator, specifically the creator of the universe. 
why would the creator be all good instead of all evil or morally neutral? How can you get to that conclusion? Well, be, because God is because God is God. There is, there is no evil in God. God is is moral perfection. There is. If you how, do you, see, how do you if know you want, that? If you want, how do I know that? Yes. If you want to see God, look at Jesus. Jesus is the express image of his person, the exact brightness of his... So I look at Jesus. Is there anything in evil, anything in evil at all about Jesus? Can you find anything evil about Jesus? Well, well, no, I, I think you're missing the, the objection here. So we see, sure. So we see enough evidence to lead us to a conclusion that a creator god can be all evil or all good. I don't think we, we look around and we see natural calamities. No, that's your conclusion. That's not mine. Well, you see natural calamities. Well, you have natural calamities. Natural calamities come because of sin, and they come because okay. they come from the devil, not from so, God. So why would an all good god be more plausible than an all evil god? That created the universe. God is God. He says, I am that I am. When we look at Jesus, you said before Abraham was, I am. When you look at Jesus, you see moral perfection. You see perfect. There's no evil in Jesus. When you see Jesus, you see no evil. When you see Jesus, you see God. He, but the Lord said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Any evil that comes in the world comes from Satan. And it comes from man submitting his, his government to Satan. So why do, you, government why do you believe Satan exists? Well, I believe Satan exists, number one, because I've been attacked by so many of the demonic entities <laughs> through life. Can I you talk about them. those demonic entities? You sure can. What do you want to know about them? All right, so what do you mean demonic entity to begin with? Well, the, devil, well, the Bible teaches that when, when Satan rebelled, he led a third of the angels in rebellion against God. They, they, came, they were brought to the realm of around the earth here. They were brought down into this realm, uh, realm of the earth. And he is, the devil is the prince and power of the air. So satanic, satanic fallen angels, or what we call satanic devils and demons, they operate and work with men's minds. One of their favorite lies is to say that there is no God. It's one of their favorite well, lies. Well, uh, Thessalonians also talks about how God would send people delusions so they'll believe falsehoods. The second Thessalonians. But why did he send? You have to quote the whole scripture. Because they wouldn't receive the love of the truth to be saved. For this reason, God sent judgment, strong delusion. You reject God's Son is a serious matter. Very serious matter when you reject God's Son. But it doesn't seem that there is a good reason for me to believe that. An all-loving God, we have the problem of what's called divine hiddenness. That if an all-loving God exists and he wants us to enter a union with him, why wouldn't he provide sufficient evidence to everyone so that everyone would believe? He has to, he's, he's more than sufficient evidence. It's called Jesus Christ come to the cross to die for the sins of all men and being the only one to conquer death and rise again from the dead, taking away the keys of death, hell, and the grave from the devil. But when I look around, I, I don't see that evidence. It seems to be far removed from me back in history. I, I can show you evidence of Jesus Christ. You can look at my life. You can look at Jesus. You don't see evidence. Our, even our calendars are based around the death and resurrection. Oh, well, that doesn't mean he existed or rose from the dead. He does exist. He does exist. He lives in me. He does exist. He does exist. Well, why, now, why would people be here proclaiming the word of God if he didn't exist? The Lord exists. Well, there, there are all sorts of people exists. in all different religions who proclaim different words. See, they can't all be right, right? I mean, the Hindus right, can't be right, but, and the Muslims at the same time. Or But, well, you, you take a look at Islam, all right? All is dead. You take a look at Buddhism. Buddha was an overweight guy that died. They're dead. <laughs> okay. Jesus died and rose again from the dead, and he is alive forevermore. Jesus is alive. So how do you know that? Because it's, because I'm a personal witness of that. Because the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in me. So now all sorts of people will appeal to personal revelation or personal experience, but it seems that they come to different conclusions on that matter. Well, I, I can't be responsible for other people's conclusions. All I, all I can tell you was I was a man that greatly sinned against God, and God revealed himself to me in Jesus Christ. When I accept him as my Lord and Savior, my entire life and the power of sin was broken out of my life. So it seems that it's an unreliable mechanism to arrive at truth through appealing to personal revelation and personal experience. You, you say that it's unreliable. Right. But if, if you want to go into uh, the law of compound probability. Oh, okay. <laughs> I remember the this. The law of compound probability is over 
overwhelming. I mean, the simplest simpleton. What, what do you mean, the law of compound probability? Well, the, is every th- time something is predicted in advance and it comes to pass, it doubles the chance of it happening. A 1 and 2, 1 and 4, 1 and 8, 1 and 16, 1 and 32, 1 and okay. 64, 1 and 128. Now, you see all these old prophets. See, God is all-knowing. He knows everything in the future. Right. He's all-knowing. Okay. All, see- all right. Now, are you, are you aware... Are you aware of the problem of theological fatalism? Because this is well, something you, you that comes up. Me, all right, okay. Well, all, right. Well, I, all right, sorry about that. Well, God's all knowing and all seeing. Okay. You know, in the future, came to all of his prophets, told all of his prophets this is what the Messiah would be like when he came. Everything in the Bible has been product- predicted, has come to pass. 80% of it has come to pass. All right, let's talk about some of those predictions. All right. Uh, uh, Zechariah. Uh, all right, that, Jesus, that the hands of the Messiah would be pierced, his hands would be pierced, his feet would be pierced. Um, just Psalm 22 describes crucifixion 400 years before it was invented by the Phoenicians. Okay. And 600 years after that, the Romans used it to subject people. And crucifixion, the way that Jesus would die, that every bone in his body would be pulled out of joint and none would be... There, there's a classic example okay. right there. All right, so a lot of the typical response to this is that well, the writers of the future books knew these older stories, so they wrote the Bible so that they come true. For example, it talked about the Messiah, I believe, riding through on a donkey. So in the, in, in the New Testament, Jesus rides through on a donkey. Well, maybe the writers had just written that to fulfill the scriptures. Well, when you take a look, the, the, in the Old Testament is uh, 39 books, all different right. writers. You take a look, you can read Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, and you will read perfectly. It tells you the day the Messiah will come in riding a donkey to be crucified. Okay. Zechariah 9, 9 tells you. There's so many, so many scriptures. So how do we know the authors just didn't make them come true by writing? Um, basically, there's all these different writers, right? all these different people by the Holy Spirit proclaim this and spoke this. And so suddenly one man's going to be sharp enough to gather all this stuff up and make all this story up of things that happened 600 years before, 1,000 years before, 1,800 years before. That's preposterous. The whole, to entertain that idea is preposterous. Okay. But the problem is, like I said, that the writers could simply make these things come true. We don't really have access no, 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 no. to these specific things. Why not? They're... they're so absolutely, it's absolutely proven that Jesus was here and Jesus rose again from the dead. Okay, so how is it proven that Jesus rose from the dead? How do we know that? By, by countless witnesses. Countless witnesses that recorded it. So can personal testimony be sufficient to establish? No, the miracle, the miracle happens and people testify to it. For example... Today, do you think people make up that George Washington existed? That's not a miraculous claim. It seems to be quite non controversial claim. Right. But we I'm not, I'm not, existed okay, by, I'm not, historical testimony. I'm not disputing, historical testimony. I'm not disputing that historical Jesus existed, but rather that he rose from the dead. Rising from the dead is the, the extraordinary claim. Yes, it is. So there were people, okay, let's assume he existed. I'm not going to argue that. So how do we know he came back from the dead? Because you say people saw him afterwards? Well, well here, here's the thing you have to ask yourself. If you acknowledge that Jesus existed, right. then either Jesus is the greatest liar that ever walked this earth, or he is God become flesh. How about other options? How about an option of writers added stuff to the stories, or there was embellishment, or he was several people? I mean, there are a lot of other options here. Even the Gospels have different information. Not all of them talk about the virgin birth. There are differences in the resurrection accounts, the narratives. They talk about the women. There are differences in the women seeing. Psalms 12, verses 6 and 7, God promises he will preserve his word. He will preserve his word faithful. It is a faithful testimony. It's an absolute faithful testimony. I've read the Bible through, I, I won't even tell you how many times I've read the Bible through. And the more I read it, the more I find the perfection of it. It could not possibly have been invented from my, the mind of man. It could not have happened. Well, why not? Because no man would be able to compile that kind of... It's, 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 it's almost an absurd question, why not, to me. If, if you really read all of it, it, it's just not possible that all these men could have written about this one called Jesus, that Jesus came, and as I said, he is either, who, he's either the great I am, he's either God become flesh, he said he was God. 
That was right. recorded by secular people who didn't believe in him, like Josephus. Sure, he, said sure. he's either, he said he was God. Well, Josephus was a Jew anyway, but... Yes, you know. he was from the tribe of Judah, from the family of David. But Jesus was either God or he wasn't God. Right. He's either the greatest liar that ever walked this earth, and he was God. Or people could have just added things to the stories. No, no, I don't think so. I think I think when you when you go into uh, the texts, you go into all the texts, you you absolutely find that uh, there's a very great great consistency. Okay, so let's move on to the next issue. You okay. mentioned that about God knowing the future. So He's there's on the, the present. Right. So there's the problem of what's called theological fatalism, and that God has certain beliefs, and if his beliefs are true about future future events, we can't do otherwise, because that would make his beliefs false, right? That seems reasonable. Well, well, there are certain events that are going to happen, Okay. and we are put, as, as the Prophet Joel says, we're put in the valley of decision. We decide what those events are going to be. Okay. For, I'm going to give you an example. In the ni- early 1970s, I used to preach that there would be a union, I used to tell people there would be a European Union. I had a colonel in the Air Force tell me, you're nuts, there will never be a common European currency. Today there's a common currency called the euro. But, okay. Common, common thing, it's common currency called the euro. We have a global government that is in place today. That's overwhelming. We have people that have talked about how they've established that. That is overwhelming. That is fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Bible prophecy is very... Here, Bible told us that Israel would become a nation again after being scattered to the nations. We scattered in 70 AD by the Romans. We have been in subjection for some, over 600 years, almost 700 years to the Babylonians, the Medes, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans. And then they were, they were scattered to the nations on earth. God said, I would gather Israel from all nations on earth. And, it, and that would begin a very specific time. Okay, so, so he had a belief about a future event, and the future event happened, right? So if we're not able to falsify his beliefs, then it seems there can only be one course of action that people can take. And it seems in that case that we would have no free will. We would have no free will then. No, 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 no. All right, so this is the problem. No, 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 we have a free will. See, like, for example, I'm giving you biblical proof of the perfection of God's word, that God would reestablish Israel, that God would reestablish Jerusalem, that after God would reestablish Ju- Jerusalem, that Iran and Russia would rise up and would come down to the north upon it. That's the next Happy event. Pride. All of these things, all of these things Happy are told pride. to us in advance to give us a Happy chance pride. of repentance. We have the scriptural record that everything that has been prophesied in the scripture. But you say God knows all. God knows all the events in the future. So if God knows what's going to happen and we can't do otherwise, we can't falsify his beliefs because he's he's all all knowing. Can't falsify his word. Right. So how could we be say to have free will if we can't do otherwise? If all of the future events are going to happen no matter what. Those events it's, are it's logically impossible, it seems, for us to falsify the beliefs of an the event is going to happen. Right. Israel is going to be attacked by Iran and Russia. That event is going to happen. There is going to be an antichrist that's going to come. There is going to be a great falling away. All these things. But in the midst of all this, you have a choice and I have a choice. But how can we say that something is a choice if there can only be one outcome? It, 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 no, there's, there, there's going to be many outcomes. Although there are certain ways that the world is going to go. Okay. We stand in the so, of the so the Bible talks about the book of life and that God knows everything about me. That if God were to author this book of life about all the information that happens in my life before I'm born... There's only one course of actions I can take in my life. No other actions are valid because he knows what's going to happen. No. He's given you the great gift of a free will, and you can make a choice. Well, this is the issue. Can we have a choice if there's only one future line of actions? Oh, yes. We can We can, We can. can definitely have a choice. See, for example, all the prophetic events that are coming to pass, as the scripture said perfectly, would come to pass. I take a look at those events, and I say, wow, the word of God is incredibly accurate. I repent and I accept Jesus. You have made the choice of saying I don't believe in God. But how how is it a choice if he knew that I was going to be an atheist and I can not do otherwise? He didn't create you to be an atheist. He created you with a free will to make a choice. But he knew what would happen in my future, that I would only have one course of events. But you're changing the subject. The subject is this. He has given to you free will to make a choice. But how can I make a choice if there's only one possible action in my future? No, you have, you have a choice of action. But you, you said he knows everything. I can't falsify his beliefs. 
So he already knows what I'm going to do. He knew I would be here today. You, you, people, you cannot change what is prophetically going to happen amongst the nations. You right. cannot change that there's going to be a great, great tribulation, the Antichrist, the global government. That the global government is going to have, uh, it's, the world is going to be divided into ten empires with seven governing heads. All that is going to come pa to pass. But in that, everyone is given a choice. But how do we have a choice if there's only one outcome? If there can only be one outcome. There's two outcomes. But how? If, if God were to author a book of my life, and he were to write everything I did today... I can't do otherwise. I don't have any other choices. No, no, no. That, that, that's where you're wrong. God, get, you have a free will. Well, you this can, is the thing at can, issue you now. Can choose, you can choose God's judgment or God's mercy. But how can I choose if there's only one possible future outcome? There's not one possible. There's but he knows what's going to happen, right? There's two, for you, there's two possible outcomes. But he knows what I'm going to do because he knows the future. So if he knows the future before I was born, how is it a choice? He is not... God's not forcing you to not accept him. God's not creating you to not accept him. That's so not true. So God has a belief that I'm going to eat a specific dinner dish tomorrow, right? So if God believes, if God has the belief, and it can't be false, that I'm going to eat pizza tomorrow, it seems that there's nothing else I can do but eat pizza. No, it's not that way. We're not robots that are wound up and have to go a certain way. God, the thing that God wants to deal with one great thing, and the great thing that God deals with is what do you do with his son, Jesus? What do you do with Jesus? Either Jesus is the greatest liar that ever walked the earth, or he is who he is. Either he went and died on the cross for you. If he died on the cross for you and accepted your judgment and punishment, if you count that as, an, as nothing, then that puts you in a difficult place. But he knew that I wouldn't believe in the divinity of Jesus. No, wait, well, he second. knows the future, I thought. He's given to every man a measure of faith. You, have a, you can say you don't believe in God, but you've been given a measure of faith. Well, it says in the Bible that um, the word of the Lord has been written on my heart, right? That I can have access to him, and by faith, we're saved by the word, right? But I don't have that. You do this, have that faith. this faith seems not to have been given to me. No, no, no. Here's what the Word of God says. You very much, it says that faith has been given unto every man. And the fact is, you actually do have a faith that it just bothers you so much. <laughs> well, it doesn't bother me. I just find no good reason. It seems that faith is not a reliable mechanism to truth. No, the truth. Everyone who's, Jesus said this, everyone who's of the truth hears my voice. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Truth is, the spirit of truth is found only in Jesus. And when the spirit of truth comes, Jesus will be glorified. Faith, though, seems to be leading people to different conclusions. If the Holy Spirit no, exists... No, 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 no. What? No. <laughs> what about all the Hindus out there and all the Muslims? You don't even know what faith is. It's a belief in things not seen. Belief no, no. specifically... Faith okay, is okay. a spiritual substance. But Ephesians that joins, that joins our spirit to the heavenly, joins us to the heavenly. That's been given to us. The opportunity has been given to us that we can be joined to the heavenly kingdom. It's that substance that's in us. We can either ignore that faith or put it to work. But you have every man has been given. Faith. How do we know it's there to begin with? Hmm? How do we know it's there to begin with? It's there. <laughs> how do we know? We, I'm going to tell you how you know. Just the fact that you discuss there's a God. Right. Think about that. It, if the whole concept of God is He is, he is um, the Lord is God. The, the whole how, how should I say? Put it to you this way. How can we be talking about God if you don't have a faith? Well, it seems to be a compelling question. People ask, they look around the world and say, how does this world exist? Is there a meaning? Is there this being that created it? So it seems to be a compelling question, and that's why I wonder. I was brought up in the Roman Catholic tradition. That's why I ask the question. I have the discussions because I find it interesting. So just because I have the discussion doesn't mean that he exists. Well, well what, what do you do with Jesus? What do you mean, what do I do with him? Like, like was she, did Jesus actually exist? I think I think he's a historical person. Right. Was he a liar or was he God? He said he was God. Was I'm not. Liar I'm not God? really sure on the issues. I think that when we look at the gospel, it's a simple simple issue. Jesus said, "Before Abraham was, I am." Right. That's I am is God's name. I am that. Well, that's I am. what the Bible says. He said. But he says it all over the place. The Bible says God was that God was manifest in the flesh. 
all over the place, Jesus proclaimed he was God. Many Either people, he was God or he's alive. But many people didn't know who he was. They said, are you John the Baptist? Listen, who is this listen, man? We're not sure who he is. is. Listen, the Pharisees knew who Jesus was. And they didn't want nothing. I mean, you know how the Pharisees knew who Jesus was? The Messiah was to fulfill four things. He was to cleanse the leper. He was to open the eyes of a man who had never seen. He was to um, raise a man from the dead who had not, who'd been dead for four days. And he was to cast a, 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 cast a spirit out of a man who was deaf and dumb. Right. The, the, the Jews at that time were looking for a Messiah. When Jesus healed the first leper, he told the leper, go to the priest and tell him what I've done for you. They knew who he was, but they had an arrangement with the world government of their time, the Caesar of their time, and they were being, it was very, very lucrative arrangement. Ran into Caesar. Yeah, when, they, well, they, they said this at the cross. They said, we'll not, when, when Pilate put, this is king of the Jews on the cross, Right. what, what did they say? He's not our king. Caesar's our king. So, but Caesar was making them rich in the, in the realm of this world. Everybody knows who Jesus is. Everybody knows who Jesus is. So why did he raise from the dead? You say that there was prophecy and everything like that. What was the judgment for sin? The death. wages of sin are death. Death. Right. So what did he do? When he conquered, he, he paid the price and he rose again from the dead. That he overcame, he overcame the curse of death, and he gives to us eternal life. Well, the, the question is, how do we know he came back from the dead? Untold witnesses, including me, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead now dwells in me. But how do we I'm know that? that how do we know that that's Jesus? I'm a personal witness of the fact that Jesus rose again from the dead. The so if, if I were a Muslim, you know, I'd be making the same arguments. Well, you know, Allah, I, I bear the witness of Allah. The Quran has these prophecies. No, you, you the Quran to, reveals this and that. Read, no, you have to read the Quran and get an understanding of the Quran. The Quran is exactly the opposite of the Bible. In the Quran, the leader comes and kills all the people. Well, the in Old the Testament God has killed a lot of people, too. In the scriptures, Jesus comes to die for the people. Well, he says, I, I, com I come with the sword, and a brother will be upon brother, family will rise up against family. Right? He's not so talking about a physical sword. He calls his word the sword that divides asunder soul from spirit. His word is the sword. He so, so let's about talk about the soul then. Right. So why do you think we have a soul? Well, I think that we're triune, we're body, soul, and spirit. All right? The physical body is the easiest part for us to discern. You and I both have souls. You have a, you, the, the soul is the mind, emotion, and will. It's the personality. You have a personality, I have a personality. You have a mind, you have emotion, you will, I have that. But the deepest part of me is my spirit. My soul is aware of self. My body is aware of the world. But my spirit is aware of God. So when Jesus we said, let me finish. Jesus right. said, that which is born of the spirit, of the Holy Spirit, is man's spirit. When man's spirit comes to life, you know what happens? We begin to commune with God, worship God. And receive revelation from God. Right. Because only the Lord can teach that. So, when we look at modern philosophy and modern science, people talk about personality as a result of the brain. We understand that what goes in our body is a result of the brain. When there's brain death, there's death. Personality seems to be rooted in the brain. So, if we can explain that without appealing to anything supernatural of the soul, why do we go to the soul? Well, I don't think the personality is rooted alone in the brain. I think the personality is rooted a, a lot in our emotions. Happened but those us. come from the brain, right? Well, you know, we're, we're getting... My spirit, is, my spirit, my soul, my physical, there's... there's there's, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're all interconnected. They're interconnected. Here you go. So, why appeal to the soul if we can appeal to the brain as explaining everything? Why not take the simpler of the two explanations? I don't, I don't appeal to the brain. I don't look at the brain. Well, we see when people get brain damage, their personality changes. So, if personality is rooted in the soul, why would personality change if the soul were the center of personality? Well, well the soul is a, part, is a physical, soulical connection. It's Even physical? The I mean, there, there is... The Bible says this, death is when the spirit leaves the body. As faith without works is dead, so is, so is the body without the spirit. But I thought that we were justified in faith. The faith was given to us, so if we're justified in the word... We're justified if we 
put that faith to work. <laughs> but I thought that was just given to us, though. You had said earlier it's in the discussion there. that it's I had right. that. So but if we're justified example, in the word, then how would I be condemned? For example, I've, I've been given hands, you've been given hands, but right. they only have value if we use them. But we still have them. You've been given faith, it only has value if you use them. But I thought we were already justified in the word. We're only justified if we accept Jesus. You have a brain, I have a brain. Right. We've been given that gift, we've been given the, the gift of lungs to breathe, we've been given many gifts. But the gift is only good if I use it. So now, what happens to those who do not accept Jesus? Well, here it says the world is already condemned because of sin. The whole world is already condemned. Then, then the, the end result of that is you're going to be condemned. You're going to be because you rejected. Put it, uh, uh, let me put it in a step for you. Are you married? No. If you gave your son to die for you, so you got married and you had kids. Right. And you gave your son to die for me. And I rejected that. How would you feel toward me? I counted that as nothing. How would you feel toward me? Oh, I don't want to see people dying. I wouldn't offer my son for a sacrifice. But, I don't... but, but let, let's say, let's say, let me give you an example. Let's say there's a man and his son. They move the tracks on a train. Okay. And if they don't move the tracks, the train is going to crash and go off. Right. Right. And the man has a choice, let his son get run over by, by the train, or save the entire train. He chooses to save the entire train. Okay. And the people got up, got off and said, the death of your son means nothing to us. How do you think that father would feel? He, he would probably be upset. How do you think the father, how do you think the father feels when we reject Jesus? Well, there are many sacrifices that we can take as individuals, and not all people necessarily appreciate it. I mean, there are people in foreign countries who die for certain reasons, but not everybody thinks those reasons are good reasons. But they're not the sacrifice of the magnitude of God's son. So why all of a sudden does that compel everyone else or put some kind of responsibility on everyone else to accept that sacrifice? Because Jesus died for your sin and my sin, my rebellion, your rebellion, and he's willing to take that away from us. And if we choose, if we choose that rebellion over his great sacrifice, where does it leave us? But how can I necessarily be blamed yes, you if... No, you know <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have to answer that question. That, that, that sounded like a... Um... There you go. <laughs> oh, that, that, that took me off a little bit there. But, um... You're going to have to answer that one. Well, if, if I would see God after death, I would take the line of philosopher Bertrand Russell. Why not enough evidence, God? Why not enough evidence? Since the heavens declare the glory, they show his handiwork. That's what the Bible makes plain. They utter speech. The trees utter the speech that God exists. I, everything I look at utters to me that God exists. Are, are you familiar with the movie Mask of the Red Death? Nope. It's a horror film, and the main character says, how can you look around this world and believe in the goodness of a God who rules it? You know, you say sin, you say sin changes it, but did God change the natural laws of the universe because of Adam's sin? Man was given man was given dominion over God's creation. When Adam sinned, that he still has the same dominion. But yet God knew that that was going to happen. But he also the so why should we be punished then if we had no other option? We do have an option. But he knew it would happen. Nothing else could have happened. We have an option. The greatest love that has ever been demonstrated is what Jesus did on the cross. That's the greatest love. Our options is to accept it or reject it. God throws a thousand signs in front of us all the time. Well, there are also, obviously these signs aren't compelling enough because there's they're, a they're lot of non-belief around. To me, they're overwhelmingly <laughs> compelling. <laughs> but, but a lot of, um, overwhelmingly a lot of atheistic philosophers would disagree with that. I don't care about atheists. They're fools. <laughs> the Bible says that only the fool has said in his heart there's no God. What do I care about? An atheistic, an atheistic philosopher, he's here, he dies, and he right. goes to judgment. We don't even know their names. The name of Jesus, we know. We know that. Well, we, we surely know their names. We know David Hume. We know Bertrand Russell. We know these people. I know, I'll, I'll guarantee this. You go and you ask people these names if they're known. You ask if the name of Jesus, which is a more famous name, they're well, dead. There are people like Hitler who did horrendous things, and they're famous. That's true. That's what, that's what sinful nature will do. Sinful, sinful nature. nature. Sinful nature, when it runs this whole course, is death. Well, this is the thing that goes back to the free will, and that how could we be said to have a genuine choice 
you, you say, well, there could be other options. There are other options. You no, know, you're an intelligent young man, but I can't believe you're missing such an elementary thing. <laughs> what is that? It's so elementary. What is? And I think your, your intellect is clouding the elementary nature of it. But if God's, if God were so evident to exist, then it shouldn't be an issue. It should be so obvious to me. I mean, there are a lot of things that are obvious to me, like torturing babies for the fun of it is immoral. That seems to be very obvious. That seems to be a simple matter. And if God... Do you think that's sinful and wicked? Well, I would call it immoral. I would say it's objectively wrong. So you you don't think it's wicked to torture a child? No, I... Well, I wouldn't use that language, but sure, why not? I'll I'll say it's wicked. I'll say it's wicked, sure. Was what uh, what, uh, Adolf Hitler did and Joe Stalin and all of them, was that wicked? Yes, sure. Right? There's such a thing as wickedness, right? Sure. There's such a thing as evil, right? Sure. Could you find any evil wickedness in Jesus? Condemning people to hell. No, he doesn't condemn people to hell. We condemn ourselves to hell. But he, he made the rules, right? Let me put to you this way. Okay. Let's, take, let's, say, let's say you live in Dallas, Pennsylvania. All right. And you say to me... Can I, have, can I have a ride? And I'll say, sure, I'll give you a ride. Sure. And you don't take it. Right. And then you turn around and say, what a rotten guy that John Murray was. He didn't give me a ride. <laughs> it's that elementary. But in this case, I don't think that it's moral to set up a rule like that. So Worship now you, now or Are you the hell. critic of God? Yes. Okay, well, <laughs> I, I have the fear of the Lord in me. I don't. Uh, to me, I, I think I think the choice is wonderful. I think the gift of a free will is a wonderful. Well, thing there, there are many people I get to choose to love the Lord. There are many people who have been raised in different religious traditions, and they don't seem to have that that inclination to the gospel or Christianity that they might have been raised with in a, a very fundamentalist Muslim home. Should those people be condemned? The Lord promises His word's going to go to the ends of the earth. You know, we were just down, a little while ago, we were down in, uh, to a Muslim prayer meeting in Washington, D.C. 5,000 Muslims were there. Right. And we were sitting there proclaiming to them that Muhammad's dead. <laughs> right, dead. right. Jesus is alive. Well, they say and, Muhammad and, and, flew and, to heaven on a winged horse. Now, now, but... now, Catch what happens. Did, did he fly to heaven on they the wing of horse? They are giving to us. They're, we took, they took so much information from us about Jesus. Amen. Because they, because everyone knows, Jesus, deep in their heart, everybody's been given us. a measure Lord, of faith. Everybody grace. knows who Jesus Lord, is. And he is a loving God and a merciful God, but he's a just God. And if you reject him... But there's a consequence. Well, the contention is, is it just to set up a system in which he know people would disbelieve and then condemn them for it? The whole world was condemned under Adam already. And how is that just? When, when Adam chose... I, ha- I had nothing to do with, with what when, when Adam did. Adam, when Adam chose another guy, when Adam chose another guy, here you go. She doesn't want it. When Adam chose another God, and he made man subject to that God, we've suffered Adam's consequences ever since. But God knew that that would happen. He knows the future. And And now people are condemned. Now the wonderful thing is, they don't have to be condemned. He brings the greatest thing of all. But they couldn't do otherwise. This is that contention back with the free will. Everybody here, everybody in the whole world can give their life to Jesus and escape condemnation. He paid the penalty for it. What if I object to the system at all and say it's an unjust system? Well, you can take it up with him when you die. (laughs) I guess I'll have to. All right, well, thanks for talking today. It was nice chatting. Okay, God bless you.